just like that I'm back home in the cave just like that Could somebody please slow time down holy shit seriously I'm not kidding I'm so frustrated with how fast time's flying it drives me freaking insane it's stupid it's stupid so many things to do and get so frustrated when everything seems so simple but it's not it's like man oh man the days just go bam 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 and you feel like you're spinning your wheels in a way anyway that's quite the uh road trip i just did then here's a side note so a friend of mine one of my very very closest friends family uh, unfortunately got diagnosed with cancer was it last year shared the uh, GoFundMe here a lot of people from here helped too which is very very kind appreciated they have three beautiful young daughters and uh, the whole house got riddled with it's either COVID or the flu whichever one you believe it may be and unfortunately like my friend he's a first responder and his wife the my friend also who was diagnosed with cancer she works in a lab and they were mandatory had to take one of these a whole bunch of these and then uh she got rushed down to freaking vancouver in a house in a in a ambulance because she couldn't breathe and nearly just say she's having a tough time she's still there and then my friend the husband of my other friend <laughs> right mention the husband um, first responder, he's been on his back flat out for like six days, seven. And then another close friend of mine who I uh, also lives in the same community and also a first responder working with other buddy, he got sick and he's been on his ass for days and he as well had to take the mandatory. <laughs> so I raced over there, dove into their house. I don't care. I'm not scared. I never took one of these and I'm not getting sick. <laughs> so anyway. I don't even know why I'm mentioning that. I guess I just am because I feel I should. That's what I just did this past few days. And as well, I had a, uh, a sea can over there, some stuff stored in it, including about a 600 pound safe. Gun safe that's now in the box of my truck. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of my truck and get it in here. <laughs> but I'll figure that out after I do this. And I managed to do a hike and get my trail, some trail cameras at a spot. That was a lot of fun. I love going on my mountains there. Anyway. What is it now, Tuesday? It is Tuesday, isn't it? Man. So, I have about five or six people I need to get on here via Zoom. Maybe I'm going to pull one of those off this evening. Maybe. I don't know. And, uh, and get some knowledge shared, right? Anyway, babbling away. Trying to get my uh, brain lined out here and get focused and somewhat relaxed it's freezing freaking cold out here the frost is on the ground poor Sarah's a little nervous because I want to take her steelhead fishing one of these mornings as well you got to do what you love doing no matter what as well right no matter what it, no matter what you got on the go now listen to this I'm gonna try to read off of my laptop which the camera's hanging off of for a change to see how that goes instead of my phone now I don't know what this is about but listen to this All right, the first paragraph. All right. Quote, my brother and I have seen something we kind of refer to as our Bigfoot sighting, end quote. But I'm not sure if it was a Bigfoot, but that's what we call it. We were repelling off of a real tall trussel out over the Judith River, actually just a creek, and it's starting to get late. We just pulled the rope and we were heading off of the trussel. We we're out there with another guy and his wife. He had left sooner than the rest of us and was at the car already. We saw someone coming towards us, and we just assumed that it was another guy. He got a bit closer, and I noticed his legs. I thought at first that he had on some shredded-up old pants, and that he was just some homeless dude walking along the tracks. Then he got closer still, and I saw the legs for what they were. I about melted where I stood, as I saw the matted up hair with small sticks and burrs just making it a total mess. 
so tangled and dirty, you'd have to shave it to the skin to fix it. It was right about then that he lifted his face a bit and noticed us. I looked him right in the eye. We were about 30 to 40 feet from him by then. Wow, he's right in front of you. He was trudging on the rocks on the tracks, just dragging each step, and made a lot of sound doing it. He just stood there for a moment. Then he turned to the side and jumped the whole ditch beside the tracks at the edge of the trussel. The ditch is about the normal size of any road ditch, and he jumped it almost as if he was picked up and placed on the other side. Then he jumped the barbed wire fence with the same absolute weird way. Hold on, this is really wide screen. Just so unreal looking. After he was on the other side of the fence in the field, he turned his head and gave us a quick last look as he leaned forward into a 45 degree angle. He should have just fell over. Lingered for a few seconds around the ground where he took off from. He shot over the field like he was drugged by a jet passing over. He was doing well over 100 miles per hour. I know what 200 miles per hour looks like, and it was way faster than that. Again, it looked very unreal, like someone made a movie with poor effects, except we were watching it happen right there. He was only about maybe seven feet tall, a lot less hair around his face and eyes, and you could almost see skin in various places due to the terrible, disgusting, matted hair. The hair was light brown, kind of sandy color. His eyes looked human. He seemed to be very old. I don't know that, but it was the feeling both me and my brother Ty had. I have to wonder what that creature is doing this very moment and where he might be right now. No, we weren't on any LSD or anything. We were so weirded out about it. Ty could barely drive home from there. We were almost crying and laughing at the same time. It was so intense. We still don't know what to think about it or whether to call it a Sasquatch or a Yeti or a Bigfoot. It just doesn't coincide with other people's stories. Although I heard one lady's account of a Bigfoot jumping a fence and she described it practically the same way. Like he didn't even exert the energy, the energy necessary to accomplish it. That's the only time I've heard of a similarity. Very weird. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with a strange anxiety of if, as if this thing is right outside my window. I don't know what that's all about, but it's happened maybe three times since the encounter. And that happened about five or six years ago. Oh crap, maybe maybe seven or eight. I hope this goes through. You're banned from commenting on YouTube, Reddit, and other leftist shithole websites. Boo hoo. <laughs> okay, man, I gotcha. That's one hell of a frickin' experience. And that's another one where that's another uh, written one where you go, huh? Who just woke up in the morning and decided to make that one up? I don't think so. I believe this person saw what they saw. My gut's saying for sure. The speed thing. The speed has been mentioned how many times? Right? I'm a broken record saying that, but it is what it is. It's a pattern. And the speed. I've had friends, people that I know, told me flat out the thing that scared them the most was how fast it moved. Try picturing something like that. Like, try picturing something being alive for real in your front yard or whatever. And it moves so fast, it scares you. It's something else, right? That's something else. Appreciate you sending that in, man. I appreciate you sending that in with the details. You know, don't hold back the details, you guys, no matter how crazy it sounds. All right, we got to hear them all. Now, that wasn't too bad reading off the laptop, but I think I feel a little smoother on my phone because these the font was real tiny and the paragraphs are that wide and I'm scared of losing where the next sentence starts when I go back. It sounds funny, but let's see who's next. All right. This is titled Pennsylvania Mountains. Imagine if you had five bucks for every time you heard of one of these sightings in the state of Pennsylvania. Maybe even a one dollar. Hey Steve, thanks for your dedication to the truth and your willingness to hear our stories. I've had some pretty weird experiences over the encounters over the past 
few years and wanted to send them your way. Hopefully, this will find the people who need to hear it. Your channel's done a lot of good for me. Seeing you out there and knowing what you know makes me less afraid. I like to, I love to hike by myself a lot. Well, me, my camera, and my handgun. These moments jaded this place for me for a while. Though, what's life without a little mystery and adversity? I heard the samurai chatter on top of my favorite local mountain. Definitely was two voices. Then, following immediately after that, was bipedal footsteps coming towards me in the fallen trees. It's daylight, but I can't see anything approaching. The trees were bare, not a lot of cover besides a few trees and boulders. I still have no idea how I couldn't see what must have been within 20 to 30 feet of me. I kind of pretended not to notice. I just kept taking photos as the steps got closer. About 15 feet behind me was a boulder pile as I spun around super fast, trying to get a glimpse of what was sneaking up behind me. I saw an arm covered in black hair sink back behind the boulders. Shoulder to wrist, it moved so fast, I just stared at the spot, jumped down the rocks to the trail, and kept my eyes on the boulders as I got away from there. Absolutely. One of the most terrifying days in the woods to date. I know what I saw and heard, and it sounded just like the Sierra sounds. I've been taking photos of the sun setting on the valley across from me and and spammed that shutter when I turned around. When I got home, which was... Hold on. I've been taking photos of the sun setting on the valley across from me and spammed that shutter when I turned around. When I got home, which was a decent hike and bike back, no photos for that five to 10 minute span. And I know I had taken a bunch of images. What makes it worse is I went back. Sorry. Yeah, what makes it worse is I went back. I hiked a different route and just got to the top where it levels off and the foliage is very dense. I was again taking photos and I heard a long, drawn-out whistle. It was very low and monotone coming from the dense foliage in front of me. I waited and heard it again. It must be right there, but I can't see anything. Then it goes again and again. So I mimicked the whistle back and immediately got it getting a response. This goes on for about a minute or two. Then I think to myself as I'm kind of freaked out that I should not be afraid. And with intention did a three-tiered whistle for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No response at all from that one. I adjusted my handgun in my camera bag and said, F this bullshit. Went back to what I came there for. Sunset picks from the top of the mountain. Well, I do that and actually stay up there till it's dark because the view is amazing. And while up there, I kept hearing something walking around me about 20 feet back. Then it followed me down the mountain. For the entire hike down in the dark, the only light I had was from my cell phone. So dark, so unprepared. Lost the trail a few times and had to turn around to walk towards whatever was following me with the light from my phone barely keeping me from being in complete darkness. Afraid and feeling like an idiot, I asked Jesus to be with me on this descent, and the fear left me. Over three miles of hiking to go, and this thing still behind me, I made it off that mountain, and thank God for that. I don't regret it one bit. Don't let these things take away your passion for the outdoors. I've not been back up there for a while, but I see the mountain every day. Every time I went to that peak, weird things would happen around sundown. And then I would have a stalker behind me on the way out. Both my dogs would get so freaked out from that, they knew something was up. And could hear it trailing us. I will go back there, and soon. Life is too short to be afraid, and that's my favorite place to hike. This time with a bigger lens and a bigger dog. <laughs> Take care, Steve. You are a valuable voice in this fight for truth. Sincerely, Brigham. You can share my name if you like. This is this is all from the Blue Mountain Range. Okay, man, appreciate you sending that in. I don't envy that experience. I've somewhat lived it sort of. Maybe even a couple few times. And that if you watched uh, my last video I posted up, that timber that I was in, 
that timber that I was in, it connects to another side hill where I had my trail camera and it showed those weird lights behind it. Same forest patch and I as well found a footprint in a, in a side of a, where a tree root ball had fallen over and uprooted all the, the soil and sandy like dirt, whatever dirt. I found a footprint in that one time too in that same timber I was in. So I'm just sharing with you what I know what goes on in that very same forest that I showed you in my last video. So imagine being in that timber walking along in the dark and hearing something in that forest following you. Like this man, right? It's something that like I thought about it the whole way I'm walking. I think about it every time I'm in the forest, just so you guys know. That same forest where I took you in the video, I'm thinking about it the whole time. I'm thinking not today. It's every time I go in the woods around there, I'm thinking in my brain, not today. Not today. Just leave me alone. You know? Just leave me alone. Okay, we got another photo. I'm on the fence. You know, sometimes I don't share photos and I'll get a whole bunch of hate mail. Just because you don't want to see the photos doesn't mean we can't. I know, but you know, on the same hand, I don't, I'm not the photo critic. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to have a YouTube channel that critiques photographs and videos. I, I'm not into it. I don't want to do that. Right. So what do I do? So I get people sending me photos. Hey man, what do you think of this photo? I don't know. You know what? My, I believe my reaction to what do you think of this photo is probably being 99%. Not much. That's just me though, right? That's me. I don't expect anyone to agree with me. But I'm caught in a bit of a somewhat, not hard, that hard, but it's a, bit of a little bit of a minor issue when it comes to a gazillion photographs shared with me and that's it. And no experience. It's like, oh, I found this photo. I found this photo. I want to see what you think, you and the round table think. For me personally, I think that's a waste of time. At this point of the game, we know what's up. We know they cannot be photographed clearly. We're going to have to accept that fact, right? We've got a lot of people who claim to have seen clear photographs. Maybe they can, but so far on this channel, they can't. All right? Yes, I do have a thermal video of when there's something else. And I'll be talking to the person who sent that to me shortly, real shortly. But for the most part, photos, they just don't seem to be panning out. You know what I mean? And the ones that do pan out and they're crystal clear, they're fake as shit. Anyway. So, do I share this? Okay, I'll do it again. What do we got? Steve, I found this on Facebook. It says it comes from a tr from a train camera footage. I ain't got no idea if it if it real, fake, etc. What I have learned from your channels, it certainly matches the descriptions. I don't know if a train tracker like that in North America, but I am guessing you will. It looks about the right size. If that's real, it's a great pick. Looks like hair is described, not fur. Looks like the white skin underneath. It matches the descriptions perfectly. If it's fake, they've pushed the boat on this. They've, sorry, they've pushed the boat out this, this. Okay, typo. Cheers, Andrew Grove, Scotland. Okay, Andrew, appreciate the photo. If that was a real one, it's a midget. <laughs> so you can almost, well, anybody should be able to stand on one railroad track and jump to the other side, like no problem. So knowing that, um, if that is where one of these beings, it's a mini. <laughs> That's about maybe five feet. Does it seem real to me? All right, so if that is a legitimate train track, can't see any ties in it. It's full of gravel. Um, I know for 100% fact because a lot, a lot of places I hunt have train tracks just like that going through timbers. Very similar to that. And it's all just, it's just crushed rock. Slopes going up to it. And I, I, it bothers me sometimes I try to get down those gravel slopes to get to where I'm going without leaving my footprints. And it's real hard because it's loose gravel. So... This picture, you zoom in on the picture, that sucker isn't even making a scuff <laughs> right in that soft gravel shoulder. Now, but here's something that's really weird to me with this photo. You look to the right-hand side and you see that big cedar tree, real big cedar tree. That looks way too close to those train tracks for me to think this anything about this is legitimate. Something's really weird. And as well as the photo, the light, 
There is no way that's a train headlight. Not a chance. It, uh, trains eliminate half the planet when they when the lights come on. All you people who work on trains know that is is fact too. So yeah, no. For me, this is an easy no-brainer. Nope. Fake as shit. <laughs> right? Fake as shit. There you go. I'm not even going to load it onto my video editing program because it takes a lot of valuable time. But I appreciate you sending that in. I know you may not be with familiar with all the basic elements in it, but that's a very, very phony, fake photograph. Now, moving along. Hello, Steve. My name is Brian. I live in the state. If you turn it sideways, it looks it would look like a gun. I'm 55, and the experience that I want to share happened around 2011 and 2013. We have a cabin in central Idaho, and occasionally we could we would take the four wheelers out five or ten miles and then hike some. This time I was with my wife, and we were walking an old logging road. It had a lot of timber timber fall on it. And I was just showing her some areas that I hunt that I found beautiful. We had stopped to take in the view to the north of the logging road, which was downhill several hundred feet. As we faced the view, we both spotted something out of our peripheral vision flying over our head and watched it hit a tree about 20 yards in front of us and then fell to the ground. First instinct was to turn around and look up the hill. Well, we saw nothing. She asked what was that, and I said I thought it was a rock because when it hit the ground, it made a deep thud sound, not like a pine cone would. My wife kind of dismissed it. I was a little more curious about what the heck that was, but the human mind rationalizes and goes on with life. Second weird occurrence. My son and I were hunting mid-October. We were up on the mountain, hiking around 5 a.m., well before sunup. It was drizzling rain all morning. We weren't seeing any deer. There were a few other hunters that had drove past earlier that morning. My son and I decided to dig in, and we hiked up another trail to get us deeper into the woods. We found what looked like to be a nice small opening with game trails, so we hunkered under a very large pine tree that probably had a 16-foot base. As far as the limbs, it was perfect cover, plus got us out of the drizzling rain. We had been there for about 20 minutes, when off in the distance, about 150 yards, we heard... A very familiar sound, yet it did not belong with south yet it did not belong within thousands of miles of where we were. That sound was a lion's roar. Not a mountain lion. It was an African lion roar. My son and I determined it roared about four, maybe five times in about five or ten minute period. My son looked at me and said, Dad, what was that? I didn't answer because I didn't know what to tell him. Later we discussed it. We shared it with other hunters in our family. Fortunately, they just said that they don't know what it could be, and that it was, that was pretty much it. When we come home, we did Google and YouTube lion roar in the mountains and did come up with a few videos that were very, very similar. One of the videos was out of Ontario, Canada. I was curious if you have heard anything like this. I've never had my own visual encounter. I've always found a deep belief based on credible people sharing their story. And if it helps anybody, there are people out there like me that haven't had their own visual encounter that take these people that have seen a Bigfoot very seriously. Thanks, Steve. Keep it up. Regards, Brian. Brian, appreciate your words of encouragement and support for the people, man. And you know what you heard. <laughs> right? You know, you know what you heard. Without a doubt. A lot of people describe it as the, as the lion's roar combined with something else at the same time, too, right? But there you go. There you go. All right, what's this one? Next. Mike Ray investigates Bigfoot food sources in a swamp. Steve is Mike Ray. I sent the description of the female Bigfoot to you. My dad and I decided since the weather is warm and dry, we'd do a bit of investigation in the area we saw the female. We set up trail cameras near a trail near a trail bordering a swamp area near to where we hiked in in March. 
left four cameras 50 yards apart facing the trail on the swamp. Three of the four were recovered, and all within with two weeks. Sorry. Three of the four were recovered, all with two weeks of photos of deer, elk, and bobcat, no big butt. The missing trail cam was not cut down. Rather, the six-inch alder we attached it to was snapped above the mount and slipped off. Gone. Heavy Oregon grape bushes on the floor around, so no prints. As we searched for the camera, we noticed along the edges of the swamp there were several areas where the cattails were pulled out of the mud with missing rootstock. It looked as if they were bit off then simply discarded on the ground. It wasn't a harvest. Rather, it appeared to be like something was browsing, selecting the young plants, leaving the tail, older stalks alone. There were water-filled prints noticeable, however, not defined. It didn't take photos since they don't impress anyone. As we moved around to the south side of the swamp, we were hit with the odor of decomp. Strong smell of something dead. The smell came from an area where it's full of blackberry, scotch, broom, and heavy undergrowth tucked up against the short pine. All next to a planted area of pine and fir planted in 1981. The two streams feeding the pond slash swamp year-round. A larger creek, 6 to 8 feet across, 8 to 16 inches deep, running near the swamp, spilling into the Chehalis River. This creek hosts salmon three times a year for spawn. Other food sources include Oregon grape, blackberry, huckleberry, wild apples, off of nine trees. They are obviously eating the cattails, crawfish, and freshwater mussels abound. A large herd of elk reside in that area and move from Winlock, Washington, through Vader, Washington, to the south, up to the town of Payel, Washington, and back to Adna. Excuse me, plenty of deer as well. Once in a while, you run across an old deer skeleton, not dumped by man, rather miles from the main road where nobody hikes. I believe we stumbled onto their habitable food sources. We haven't seen nor heard one in the six times we've gone out. But I am clear, as my father is as well, on how these Bigfoot survive. Since my encounter, I've been starving for more information. I need to know more. I've been focusing on things that I've not heard anyone describe. The search area has been confined to this water source so far. However, I will venture out further to find anything to do with them. I smartly take someone with me since I have no idea what to expect. I hope this helps someone fill in the blanks. Or as you say, pieces of the puzzle. Steve, keep inspiring everyone. Damn glad you're here, Mike. Hey, man. Good luck in your adventures. I th I'd like to hope to think by now you probably may... I want to accept the fact that our simple primitive trail cameras aren't good enough. They just aren't. They're not good enough, although there's, it's common for these people to screw with them. I remember I had my trail camera years back. Remember I said, I think it was a video titled, I filmed Sasquatch or not, I filmed what we saw, right? And there's all those um, baby poplars broken off everywhere. The ground stomped flat. And then I had a trail camera about, about 150, 200 yards from there on a big uh, cottonwood tree and it had been grabbed and spun and facing so it would face the other tree about here to the wall from it making it useless and that tree i was had to stand up on the you know the ground rise up to the base of the, the tree and i have to stand on top of that hold on the tree with one hand and i put the, the camera up there so it's probably what eight feet off the ground and there's no way a human being could have approached that camera without getting recorded on it when you walked up to it and I did have a moose on the camera before it got spun so that tells me uh, a human did delete my content off that SD card after a potential human would have spun it right all I'm saying is something messed with me that day and that's as, as well the exact same trail my friend heard the tree getting beat on when I went to get the quad and I didn't hear nothing anyways I guess what I'm saying is they're not scared of our trail cameras. They know they can't get caught on them, and they just mess with us with them sometimes. That's what I'm saying. Do I think anybody's going to catch one of these clearly on a trail camera? No. That's just me. Now, this is titled My First Encounter. Greetings, Steve. My name is Daniel Carrick. You may use it if you choose to read this. 
I've been binge watching your videos, along with David Plasses, for about six months now, and I can't get enough. So much of what has been shared lines up with my experiences so precisely that I sometimes find myself shaking my head in amazement with what you're reading and others' experiences. The words, quote, that happened to me, end quote, echoes over and over again in my mind, and I find myself sitting and shaking my head in utter astonishment. I've had four such encounters in my life. However, I'm going to share with you this first one. I have shared my others with my immediate family, my wife, my daughter, my son, and granddaughters, but this one was different. I'm 64 years old, grew up in Bend, Oregon, and spent much of my time backpack, backpacking the Three Sisters and Broken Top Wilderness areas in the Oregon Cascades, as well as hunting the high desert, desert of Central Oregon. As a retired park ranger, I was always outdoors and found I was blessed by our creator to have been given such an opportunity in life. I also grew up hunting and fishing with my dad. We took many a trip out east of Bend to the high desert area of central Oregon or up in the foothills of the Cascades just to spot deer and other wildlife the area had to offer. We loved the outdoors and getting out. On this particular outing, at the ripe age of 17, I decided to do a solo hunt in the Three Sisters slash Broken Top area. My dad and I had located several huge mule deer bucks in that area the week before, but were never able to get a shot off. I got home from school early that afternoon, packed up my gear and was off, fully determined to harvest one of those big boys. I parked my dad's truck and walked about two miles, still hunting, taking a few steps, stopping, listening and looking like my grandfather had shown me how to. I was walking along Tumalo Creek, T-U-M-A-L-O Creek, and found a mature fir tree that had a double base at ground level. A crotch, if you will. Okay, gotcha. It was the perfect place to sit down and situate my, my back in the crotch, where the base had split into two separate trees, to be quiet and just watch and listen. And much to my surprise, I found myself getting increasingly drowsy, couldn't fight it. I laid my 30-30 model, model 94 across my legs and soon nodded off into a sleep, a dreamless sleep. The white noise of the creek, the gentle breeze in the canopy over my head made for the pristine environment and soon I was snoozing like a baby. Three hours later, holy, that's a good one, dog hairs. <clears throat> Three hours later, something woke me. I like to think that it was my sixth sense alerting me to whatever activity was taking place around me, and as I opened my eyes, I remembered where I was. To my surprise, the biggest mule deer doe standing quietly at my feet, just looking at me. The words that came into my mind were, I'm not here to harm you. She looked directly into my eyes, raised her head, and started walking away to my right. And as I watched her walk away, she turned to look back at me, and the words, I'm not here to harm you either, Daniel, flooded my mind. She knew my name. Then she vanished into thin air. What the hell? She didn't walk behind a tree or over a knoll. She didn't cross the creek in front of me. She was just gone. There was no sound. But there was a blue orb where she had been standing about 10 feet off the ground. And I watched as it disappeared into the forest. I soon realized that I couldn't hear the creek just a few yards in front of me. I couldn't hear anything. The forest was completely silent. No birds, no crows cawing, no squirrels, nothing. I remember pinching my thigh to make sure I was awake. I was. For some reason, I began to feel the deepest sense of peace I've, I have ever experienced in my life. I began to weep as I asked myself, what just happened? I wept all the way back to the truck trying to reason with myself what had just taken place. No answers came. You can probably guess why I have never told this story to anyone until now. Who would believe a 17-year-old kid trying to explain how the biggest mule deer doe standing right in front of him simply vanished into thin air? Only after watching your videos did it occur to me that these beings may possess the power to change their appearance. appearance. I know it sounds crazy, but just maybe, just maybe they can. 
I've had three other encounters since that first one, all spaced out about seven years apart. Coincidence? I don't know. I may never know. As I type this, I'm fighting back tears as the memory of what happened comes flooding back into my consciousness. Anyway, that actually happened to me, and I'll never, ever forget it. My entire narrative of nature was at that moment in time changed forever. Was it a Sasquatch shape-shifting as not to startle me? I don't know. Thank you for all you do. One of the highlights to my morning is pouring a piping hot cup of coffee, walking into our home office, and listening to your latest video. I also grew up with horses and understand the bond that takes, takes place us and them. So very sorry for your loss. Take care, Steve. And again, thank you. Sincerely, Daniel Carrick. Okay, man, I got you. Might have taken a little while to get to this one. I apologize for that, but it is what it is. But we got her done. And that is one hell of an experience. And I understand why it would be a little freaking confusing to think about sharing that publicly, right? Especially today when so many people's minds have been manipulated to be dumb as a freaking hammer. Do we think that was a Sasquatch being? I haven't a clue. Haven't a clue myself. But the orb thing is very interesting, right? The orb, the balls of light. The balls of light that are part of life here for a lot of people. What are they about? I appreciate your honesty, man, your, and your courage to come forward with that story. Absolutely appreciate you. What a crazy experience that must have been. Here's another one. Urban Indiana. Well, actually, maybe that's a trigger to memory. I'm going to share it real quick. So years ago, I was in between hunters guiding up north in northern British Columbia, northern Rockies, and I had a three or four days, I think, so I decided to go sheep hunting by myself. And I hiked up this big, long drainage across the valley, hiked up to the bench, and then I started hiking up to get as high as I could, the highest peak right there. I'll never forget, I got it, and this is in August, I believe. And I got on top of this mountain. And it was really weird. It was perfect bluebird sky out. I'm in the middle of freaking nowhere. And uh, same thing, I'm just like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna lay down here and have a nap. And I had a nap, and I believe what happened, because it was like, it felt like the temperature outside must have been the exact same temperature as my body. And I could not hear a thing. I mean, nothing. It was it was almost like I was like tucked into a womb or something, but I was on the top of this mountain. So I laid back in the, in the uh, whatever, the thin layer of mountain lichen and, and somewhat grassy, tall little plants and flowers. I just laid there, fell asleep. And I remember when I woke up. I remember waking up, I didn't quite know where I was at first. And I was laying there, my eyes closed, awake for a little bit. And I thought I was in a deep freaking coma because there was no wind, no sound, no nothing. And no, I couldn't even tell that I wasn't, the temperature, everything was just level. When I woke up, I'm like, holy cow, this is crazy. Woke up on top of paradise and I stood up. I'm looking around and I stepped forward about eight feet and I looked down below me and right below me over the edge was about 30 mountain sheep laying there. I just about had a heart attack. And they all got up, kind of looked at me, and then walked away. All using lambs, meaning females and young ones. But I'll never forget that. Nobody spoke to me, thank God, in my mind. Anyway, just shared that one. Urban Indiana Sasquatch. It sounds like it might be familiar. We'll see. Hey, Steve, my name is Nate. I like your style. What are you doing, man? This happened in early summer 2009 in northwest Indiana, 10 minutes from Lake Michigan. My best friend Kyle and I were catfishing in a small pond. It was after midnight. We're at the bottom of a grassy hill. Behind us was a building with a floodlight attached to it. We're on the edge of a pond that was roughly 50 yards across and a couple hundred yards wide. On the other side of the pond was a ridge with one small clump of trees lightly lit up from the floodlight behind us. Beyond that was swamp woods and a creek that has one of the that has one of the best scamania runs in the country. I love to steelhead fish. Anyways, scamania? Did you mean steelhead? 
It's always started by hearing raccoons screaming, worse than any raccoon fight I've ever heard. This was 100 yards away in the swamp in front of us, and afterwards the woods got quiet. Then Kyle said he just saw something big. I said, a deer? He said, no, it was big. I blew it off and went back to fishing. About 30 minutes later, Kyle says, there it is again. I looked up, and directly across from us, something was stepping out of that clump of trees 50 yards away. All we could see was a silhouette from the floodlight being behind us. This thing was freaking huge. It took a few steps out of the trees, then stopped and looked at us. Then it takes a step back in the trees and right back out again. What it did next when it stopped is something I still don't understand. It was lifting its arms up and down, but the movement looked so weird. Then it lifts its leg, then it lifts its left leg up and down as if he was stepping on and smashing something. But he was doing it in a way that it looked like an old movie project. Cha 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 is what every movement looked like. I don't know. It's so freaking hard to explain. He then stepped back in the trees. He stayed half in and half out. The entire right side of his legs, body, and shoulder, and, he, and head were exposed as he stood watching us. It had been 30 seconds up to this point, and I say to Kyle, What in the F are we looking at? And he replied with a shaky, I don't know. As soon as, as, soon as I saw it, the worst sense of fear I have ever felt consumed me. Run, is all I could think. He's going to come around the pond and get us. He's going to come around the pond and get us, is all I could think. I didn't even reel in my fish. I didn't re even reel my fishing rods up. I cut the line and I grabbed them and I took off running up the hill with Kyle not too far behind me. I got to the Jeep, threw my shit in. By this time, I was crying out of fear. I asked Kyle again, what the F did we just see? He said, you know what that was. That was a Sasquatch. The creepy part is that from is that from the first time Kyle saw it until we both saw it again was a half an hour. That means he was standing silent in that little clump of trees for half an hour just watching us. Steve, this damn thing was eight to ten feet tall. Hair covered in black as far as I could tell, but what stood out the most were the width of his shoulders. This damn thing was four to five feet wide. There's a couple hundred acres of woods where it came out from, but basically in the middle of a city. What in the hell was it doing there? Well, that's my story, man, and it is 100% true. My name is Nate Swain, and this happened in Michigan City, Indiana. Feel free to share my name and location if you want. It still blows my mind, but it happened. Thanks, Steve, and keep on keeping on, man. Okay, appreciate you and your honesty, man. What the hell's it doing there? I don't know. I don't know. How'd it get there? I don't know. But we know you saw it. And the location, and that's that's important to share, right? What an incredible thing to see in the four foot wide, four to five foot wide shoulders. How many times has that been shared? And the uh, the shock of that detail alone is always the, a pattern too, right? Everybody's freaked out when they say you wouldn't believe how wide this thing was or how deep the chest was. Here's another one. Hello again, Steve. I'm the guy who offered you boiled crawfish. I told you about the crazy loud scream I heard in the woods, which was in June of 2011, but I still have much to talk about. I know you're a very busy man, so this is another short story. You can read this out loud to us or not. It's up to you. I just read, I just need to, I just need to say it to someone that will listen. I've been watching both your channels for two years or so. My brother and my four nephews are big hunters. Not me, though. Sorry, I still have not seen any hairy giants or fire-breathing dragons, but I have seen some really weird stuff. I've been laughed at and made fun of for speaking my mind about subjects that are not common my entire life. I'm not a hunter. I love hunters, but I don't enjoy it personally. I'll cook any animals or fish better than most people. I love fishing for bass, crappie, brim, catfish. Mostly fresh water is what I have a lot of access to, but sometimes I get the opportunity to do some brack-ish or saltwater feeling. 
fishing, sorry, brackish, or saltwater fishing. In saltwater, I fish for redfish, speckled trout, flounder, black drum, sheep's head, whatever will bite the hook. I've lived in South Dakota, Texas, and I'm currently in Louisiana. Much of my story has to do with the supernatural, I guess. I don't know how or if Sasquatch ties into that. Since I was four years old, I've heard and seen things that nobody else around me can hear or see. I've seen things in the sky that are there, and then not there. I've seen dark shadows that are there, and then disappear. These shadows have come behind me while I wash dishes for some weird reason, and have choked me out twice, like a giant putting me in a chokehold. Twice I told my doctor that it felt like Andre the Giant put me in a chokehold. He laughed both times. In 2007 and 2017, I was washing dishes when I got that hair-raising feeling of something behind me that wanted me dead. I slowly turned around both times, knowing that something bad was behind me. I was trembling, shaking, and short of breath, already knowing what I was about to see was not good. I do 300 push-ups and 300 sit-ups a day, along with three miles of walking uphill, so my shortness of breath was not because I was out of shape. It was a dark shadow in a human-like form, about six feet tall, that disappeared as soon as I saw it. I tried to scream and curse at it as best I could while being choked. I followed with prayers to Jesus in my mind because I could not physically speak out loud. I got very dizzy, and I was sure I was about to die of oxygen deprivation. I lay down to avoid falling and hitting my head. As I was starting to see stars, then I woke up. I was on the phone with my aunt. I was coughing, choking, and trying my best to, to breathe. I was fighting whatever was happening to me as hard as I could. I was on the phone with my aunt when this attack started. My aunt was trying her best to keep me awake and comfort me, and I was terrified to say the least. I was 24 year, years old the first time it happened, and then 34 the second time, alone and knowing I was about to die of an unknown cause, choking me to death. My doctor told me it was a panic attack. I asked him what left the bruises and soreness on my throat. He said, I'm not sure. I don't know, man. I'm pretty sure we've all been lied to, just like you've said it many times. Hope and pray that your channel will sooner than later provide some real answers to the weird shit that's happening to normal people all over the world, all the time. Thanks again for giving us a safe place to speak. Again, my name is Ben. Please don't use my last name. It's hard as shit to pronounce anyway. <laughs> Thanks, brother. How do you like to cook your fish when you finally catch one? Holy crap. All right, well, that's a little unrelated, but whatever. It happened. And it's terrifying, and somebody wanted to share it, so there we go. What can I say about that? Not much myself. I know I don't want anything to do with that kind of stuff myself. There's some scary things happen to people, innocent people around the planet, inside their homes and their bedrooms. So many people, right? So many people. And we just, for whoever it is, just doesn't want to speak of these things mainstream, right? How do I cook my fish? Oh man, Sarah does that. Well, I do it too. My favorite way to cook a salmon fillet is I'll, t I'll get a cast iron frying pan, put a little bit of butter in the bottom, throw that sucker down into it, and then I will start the pan on the element till it starts to crackle a little bit. I'll also have um, maple syrup and salt. Light, light salt. Maple syrup on top of those fillets, put it in the oven, finish it off that way, and definitely do not overcook it. Never overcook your feet, your meat, right? And so it'll just be a little bit raw in the center. And that is absolutely delicious to me. It's one of the ways. There's a lot of other ways too, but that one comes to mind. Anyway, on the speaking mainstream, get this one side note. So I was at my friend's this weekend and he's got the mainstream news channel going. Whatever. And it is also the government subs subsidized channel, meaning the government, uh, the government controls what's shared on that mainstream news channel here in British Columbia. And they, they actually made a commercial trying to run down our government for censoring Facebook and making outside news sources blocked in Canada. That's what they did. So this channel goes, you know, the Canadian government has blocked sources of news coming onto Facebook, etc. So 
we have decided to become your main news source and we've had this app and you can download our app two days to make sure that you get all the news you can. <laughs> what? Oh my God. Do you see the insanity in that? Isn't that amazing? Almost like they were addressing somebody or a group of people whose brains just do not function at all. What an amazing thing for them to pay for to create. Hey, just so you know, uh, we're the ones that are censoring all the news, and this one news channel over here is the one that we control, and we're going to make believe that, you know, we're not, we're not too happy with our government blocking all the news from Canada, so we're going to offer up this app that you can download to get all your, all your, all your news sources for sure. <laughs> From the government who's censoring the news. Holy shit. That was yesterday. I had to share that one. Anyway, I gotta go. I've got this safe in my truck. I don't know how much it weighs. It's ridiculous. And I gotta get out of my truck and get it in here somewhere. How Somehow figure out where it's gonna go and unload all my stuff. And get my ass moving. I got a million billion emails to go through. I got a lot of live videos I want to get going on here. You know, I got everything on the go. Share my story at howtohunt.com. Get your experiences out and in the open and get them public while you can, <laughs> right? You want to share through the world through me? I'll do it, word for word. I'll be back.